Hey guys, Loman02. Going to be doing some commentary uh, on live gameplay um, in a small four-man event um, for Penny Lander. So these are 100-card decks that are Penny Dreadful Legal, no sideboards, and Singleton, unified copies of each card. Vivi is on a uh, mono-black mid-range slash aggressive deck, and then Gosman's going to be on a red deck win-style build. Seen Isareth turn one off of a Dark Ritual, which is a pretty fast start. I would assume, generally speaking, you want to be a little more diversified in like your threats and how they spread, like, basically more spread, more of a spread against red deck wins. That said, in this format, like the card pools are going to tend to be a little slower and more incremental. So cards like Arc Trail, um, you know, Forked Bolt's not in this one, but like Arc Trail, Arc Lightning, uh, Flames of the Fire Brand are all legal and tend to be played in the red deck win style builds for 100 card at a minimum to be able to sweep other small critters. Um, So Bivy to keep the hand, but missed land number two. Which is going to put them, I think, in an awkward spot because at two mana, the three damage burn spells do come online. There's obviously Chain Lightning at a penny um, at one, and there's a couple cards that do three only to creatures at one, but it's most likely that Gosmit will have either an answer this turn or have an additional threat that can match for power the Isareth. Um, I guess it'd be Bivy to keep their hand based on the ritual and probably like a Vendetta. I could sense that coming right now on this creature. Because Stromkirk Noble is a card that, over time, can really get out of hand if it's allowed to keep going through. There's even, like, a debate to actually keep the Isareth back, but I think the assumption is, probably from their end, is that it's going to get killed this turn, or it's not likely to be a good blocker for long. Now, they're probably... Well, they're incentivized, I guess, still to attack with it. Because the uh, Frenzied Goblin can blank it as a blocker. If you're not familiar with Frenzied Goblin, let me pull up the uh, the card preview window, because some of these cards do have altered art, and like I have to take a second look at them to even recognize them. Uh, but Frenzied Goblin is a card that basically, it's a 1-1 one, one for 1, but it makes it so that if you pay a red, you can make a thing not block. Um, Tormented Hero, not an irrelevant play, but not a great blocker the turn it comes in. Bivy has managed to kind of jump ahead in the, in the, the damage race, but the mana race, not so much. And this Annex is... Going to be problematic, to say the least. It trades very effectively, so they're going to stay back, actually. I actually don't mind swinging there, personally, unless they just miss their attack. Which I suppose... Yeah, actually, I, I know for a fact they should have swung there. Like, I don't see why they wouldn't. I'm waiting for the oops or something in chat. Could have just been an, an F6 error. So as soon as this game concludes, we'll jump to the other game. We'll try to get equal coverage of all the games, but I do want to kind of like watch one at a time, try to give it its due diligence. Um, Isareth gets in. This is going to be a pretty clean trade with the Annex, I assume. No. Huh. So yeah, they definitely have six through their attack step there. That's, that's what we saw happen, I believe. So you're not attacking and you're not blocking. What are you doing, right? Um, Fanatical Firebrand. That can knock out the Tormented uh, Hero. If desired. They just attack with all. Okay. They can also make it not block. There are some cards to be leery of out of the red deck. Um, I'm sorry, the black deck. Effects like uh, Soul Spike could definitely turn this game around rapidly. I mean, right now, Bevy is behind, but Soul Spike is a, an 8-point life shift. Um, it would not put them to dead, though. It's 5 plus 4. It's, it puts them at 2, essentially. So if they had, like, Fruit of Tizzerus plus Soul Spike, yeah. It would take Fruit of Tizzerus and Soul Spike to actually just turn this game around here. They can get in for the 5, and if Burn wasn't used to remove these creatures, Soul Spike into Fruit of Tizzerus could possibly do it. Um, but, you know, kept a Ritual Hand, uh, you know, probably hoping to hit some mana. Just didn't hit the mana, and uh, weren't able to develop uh, further. That said, the Ritual Starts are going to be generally pretty powerful, but not able to really lock it up. I do think, in general, it's a pretty tough matchup for the black deck. Um, unless you go bigger with it. Like, I think if you go like, bigger, like, not Bone Splitter size or Tormented Hero size, like, you know, Shriek Maws and uh, Lamias. I forget that card's name. Great Breaker Lamia. Cards like that, um, you know, and a lot more removal. Uh, you can tend to scale them up uh, and get some pretty big threats that just basically outgrow their removal spells, their burn. So they get down a 2-2 that does not block of note. So the Goblin Arsonist is coming through. Even if it weren't, it could you know, trade favorably in combat because of how Arsonist works. When Arsonist dies, uh, you can plink a thing. Plink someone's face, you can do one damage to basically anything. Blood Knight, not a bad one against the weenie decks of the format. This is obviously getting through because, again, the order does not block. But they're going to have four damage in the air next turn in a deficit of one mana for whatever their follow-on spell is going to be. Bivy's got to be hoping to hit a land here and probably play it. Okay, maybe not that one, but play a two-drop and equip. 
would be like the optimal, I think, thing to have there. You're definitely boxed to attacking here. Um, what could they have that's relevant? Like, Vendetta could be decent. Yeah, it's a lot of pressure. If you have the Vendetta, you probably just kill something here. Moments Craving is another card that I believe they're running um, and can also turn around some of these races pretty quickly. Just eating the Blood Knight, um, getting a first striker off the table and gaining two is pretty good. Four mana is huge. All right, yeah, it's a big demon. They can actually sack the Arsonist next turn, plink them for one down to 12 and hit them for five, though, and put them in pretty close striking range. You're definitely... You, that thing can't block, so it needs to attack. Um, I mean, it doesn't need to, I guess, but you don't really gain much by leaving it back. Unless you're hoping your opponent just misses that it can't block. But Gosma plays a bit of magic, and I don't think they're going to miss that. <clears throat> the one awkward thing is, is the Blood Knight has first strike. So if Gosman has any combination of four damage in hand, they can actually just eliminate this Desecration Demon. Um, the Bogart Ram Gang is awkward to block, so it'll turn the uh, Desolator or Desolation Desecration Demon, I'm sorry, into a 3-3, which makes it very killable by most of the burn spells that they run in their deck. Um, I think there's a chance, depending on what their hand consists of, of them just sacking the Arsonist uh, pre-combat uh, or during the, yeah, the, the begin combat phase um, to tap the Demon and then get in for the damage. If their hand's high on creatures, they're more than likely to do that. Um, at this point, they're probably just going to sack this thing, unless they think they have more relevant plays off of it later. Well, that's a figure, which means they can keep it tapped for an awfully long time. I like just jamming the figure here, sacking it to the demon, attacking again for 6 damage. Um, on the following turn, tapping down the demon, making it an 8-8 by sacking the goblin arsonist, and then just swinging for lethal on the following turn. This is a pretty good horizontal grow. It's really going to depend on no attacks. Huh. Yeah, I think I would have tried to get push some damage through there, but I guess they didn't want to sack this turn. They figure it gets better for them. But I think generally just pushing through six damage that last turn, getting them down to, uh, what, seven, is pretty worthwhile. We know Gosm's out of lands as well, so they're probably not going to double activate the figure. All right, so they sack this one. Plink to phase for one. But yeah, the black deck's definitely not out of this. I mean, like one one you know moment of craving or even consuming vapors would be pretty decent here. Would be the best, but it's going to gain you one. I don't know if they're going consuming vapors big though. But this is a turn where removal is really going to start mattering. Okay, they sack their thing to get deeper in the deck. Makes some sense. The only big question is, what do you block here? The red decks in this format, and then the Hunter card at a minimum, tend to be a little bit bigger. Like, you run stuff like Arc Slog. Well, Hell Rider is probably just good game. Uh, that's a lot of damage. So you can block out three on one of the creatures, take five off the creatures, just attacking down to seven, take lethal. Yeah, that's that's lethal damage. Um, so there's five down to seven, and you block the Hell Rider and take, you know, uh, what is that? It's ex that's one over Xaxes. All right, and that is the first match. Red deck wins, takes it down, versus what I would call, like, mono black aggressive mid-range. Um, let's check out the other game we've got going on if we're, we're still live right now. Uh, we got Necropotence and Hemlectin playing, which is going to be uh, white-green tokens versus mono-green Stompy. Um, Alright, we've got Scion of the Wilds. This card's amazing. It's a cool card. It grows with each creature you have. Power and toughness equal to the number of creatures. It's a Keldon Warlord in green for three mana, which, I mean, that card probably always should have been a Keldon Marauder. Yep, tracking. Thank you. And where'd my preview panel go? There it is. All right, we've got a veteran war leader, three mana card. Also does the same thing. You can also tap another ally you control, and veteran war leader gains your choice of first strike. Okay, gains a bunch of abilities, but I don't think there's a lot of allies in their decks. So That's probably not going to be that relevant. Um, the mono green deck does have a working yeast on right now, though, which is not um, irrelevant by any means. I think there was a world in which you want to attack with the Scion there. You're still at 18, which is a pretty healthy life total. 
I think the way this matchup will tend to go, like, if the Yisan keeps going, eventually the, the uh, Mono Green deck will win. But I think the Tokens deck can actually outvalue the Green deck. But looking at their mana situation, it's a little bit dire right now. It's not the best. But the Green deck does have some very powerful cards. You have, like, Wolf here, Silverheart, effects like that, pump spells, that can really just blow folks out in combat. And I guess, like, what? They have an attack with the Skin Shifter here. More than likely. We'll just do double check and make sure none of these are allies, because if you can give it first strike, that'd be pretty good. No, they are not. Uh, does this thing make allies? No, it makes soldier tokens with lifelink. I think you probably just take here. They're going to pump it to a 4 4, I assume. If they wanted to make it a flyer, they would have done so pre-combat to get that evasion in. They dome for four here. And it looks like nothing else. So Pump Spells is kind of like what I have pegged down as being in Necropotence's hand. Um, either that, or they're just like mana dorks, and there's not really a val much value in playing them out. Um, when you have Yisan ticking up, and you can spend three mana to do that. And their next hit will be a three drop. What do we see at three? Possibly Predator Ooze that blocks really well. It also attacks really well and just grows over time. You don't generally want to put stuff in front of it that's going to die. I could see that as a 3-drop here. But I suppose we'll see. I'm going to shrink this card preview window a bit. That was a Thaluka th th Tongue Thalid. <laughs> um, I can't say that. But basically, it's a 1-1 one -one that when it dies, brings a 1-1 one -one back into play. Or has a 1-1 one -one token come into play. A Sapperling. Um, yeah, I'm curious what we find here. A few things that I could see. One of the random cards that's legal in this format is Ramen Up Excavator that I haven't really seen broken yet. Alright, Yavamaya Dryad's fine. Just ramps the mana. It means that they have a really big creature in hand. They can cast that and also activate the Yisan. Um, and that Yisan's getting to a point where it, it's getting fairly dangerous. Yeah. Oh, that's fine, guys. You're probably going to hear me talking in it. Yeah, I know. It's not it's not the best, not the worst. It's you know, it's like purgatory, right? Alright, so we have Mask Admirers. A fine card. Draw some cards. It's a good grinding tool for this deck. Especially if you like run against sweeper decks or something like that. I was actually planning on playing blue black today, but we had an even number of players. Um and that would be a card that would be quite effective in grinding out um that style of deck. Right now, it looks like early mana advantage is probably going to sync this one up, though, with a, a, a recursive uh, means of tutoring uh, their deck. I think uh, Decker Bones looks to be in a pretty strong spot. And actually, let me do some quick uh, some quick upkeeping upkeep here, guys. I'm going to go ahead and just mute myself over this. So, folks, do not have to listen to me while I'm, I'm chatting about a game that's going on. It's not confusing. So we get the uh, Yevamaya in there. There is a forest in play. Forest Walk's going to allow it to get through, put their OP down to 12. Um, honestly, I could see this game going in a way that like they end up tutoring for a Wolfier Silverheart to make this Yavamaya Dryad really big, and then just Forest Walk through for the win on the turn they get the uh, they get the uh, Wolfier. That's just an estimation. Or they could have a bunch of pump spells and just do it all next turn, but I don't think they're going to have a lethal attack next turn. Alright, we got a fetch here. What do we have? A Johnny's not bad. I mean, it... Mm, it's also not great. The Forest Walker is going to be the issue here. But you're getting to a point where you can start probably sending in the Clowns. Their question's got to be, can I kill this thing in combat? They can make an 08 wall and just block it with the Skin Shifter. Skin Shifter's a really interesting card. It's very mana-intensive, but what all that text basically comes down to is it says it's 2-mana 1-1, one, one, and you get to play a green and choose one. It can become a 2-2 two, two bird, which has flying. Um, it can become an 08 plant wall, which is a defender. Or it can become a 4-4 four, four trampler, Rhino, I believe. Um, pretty cool card. It's just very mana-intensive, and it dies to a lot the turn it comes into play, typically speaking. Uh, what is that? That is a pro-black creature. That blocks really well. So think about Mass Admirers and the Phantom Centaur in front of something, and then like the uh, the big boy, the the 08 plant in front of something else, 
and have pretty favorable trades. They don't actually want to trade the admirers off. I guess they're looking for an attack here. Or they have pump spells, possibly. Yep, I think we're going to see the wall mode, the 08 mode, come in here. And we do. There's the plant wall. <clears throat> I think I would have just tried to eat the other one, but... I, you know, to each their own. I mean, they're at a very low life total, and actually, they're probably just dead. This is plus four, so it's six damage off of just the uh, the Yeva, the Yeva Maya Dryad, if they go for Wolf here, Silverheart here. And they can make a flyer out of the Skin Shifter, which means they're down to ten, plus six, four, and how many blockers do they have left? They have one, two, three, four, five attackers, so only one gets through, so they'd still be at three. I guess it wouldn't be lethal with Wolf here. They'd be three short of killing them. Oh, they're gonna try to get tricky. Here's how the Mast and Meyer is in to see if their OP just lets it through. They should not. Attacking with the skin shifter and giving them the blocks on it without giving it flying seems kind of odd to me. I I officially do not know what's going on here unless they're just trying to like give it trample or something like that with their spells. But if they had trample if they had pump cards, they should just get the uh get the Wolf here Silver Heart. They could just be making this skin shifter big. But, again, like, I think I would rather just give the Forest Walker the bonuses and just plink away at them because what are they going to do about it, right? Yeah. This will push more damage. I guess you get rid of two things this way, though. So there's no chance of getting counterattacked, like, with, um, you know, the possibility of, like, an overrun effect or something like that. That could be a reasonable rationale to doing it that way. All right, Ronus's last stand, just a 5-4, so they're not tapping next turn. I believe they're also out of cards to get with their uh, their Yisan. I believe they not, they're not running six drops in this deck. I believe it stops at five. It's kind of like a, a mid, medium red or medium green build. There's Johnny Greatheart. I believe this gains life and puts counters on stuff. Yep. On the other walker, even. So they down tick this one, put more counters on their stuff. That is a lot of counters. I mean... They, they have an attack here. Uh, no, they don't, actually. Wolf here is just massive. <laughs> um, they do not have a great attack, honestly. Yeah. They can make the uh, Skin Shifter a flyer next turn. So it's a 2-2 two -two with plus 4, so it's 6-8. If you count the uh, Yeva. And if they swing with everything else, they should just win. Actually, they will win. Yeah, because they don't have enough blockers to, to actually block it out. So if they make the Skin Shifter a flying 2-2 two -two and... Attack with all, they should very easily win. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I think you just swing with every single thing. There's no way you get punished here. This just kills them, because they're taking eight in a minimum. All you need is two more damage. They can only put up four blocks. They block your wolf ear, your four power thing, your three power thing, and your three power thing. And you get through four... I'm sorry, your five power thing. So you get through for like five additional damage. Alright, well they're gonna play it this way. Maybe they have a pump spell and they wanted to show off the pump spell. That could be a thing they're doing. Um... No, nope, just not going to go for the win. Seems like really risky business to me, because one of the cards that I know Hemlecton runs is Dusk Dawn, and if they got Dusk Dawn here, they could be in a rough spot, for sure. There's Garuk. A lot of cool Planeswalkers in the in the green and the, the white uh, domain. Well, they're putting counters on stuff. It comes in with an additional counter. They get to overrun. This is a pretty... Does this win? I would laugh my butt off if Necro pitch this one. Like, I'm sorry, Necro, but, like, this is something that could happen, like an overrun effect. Um, and I think you still have enough power to block this out, but you put yourself in a much worse spot. Woof. Yep. If you attack with all last turn, you just see, see, uh, seal it up. 
Oof. Rough beats. Uh, cause I don't. I actually, I don't know if this is a beat, but I think it is. At a minimum, it's pretty damn close to a board wipe. So you have two toughness, four toughness, six plus eight, fourteen, three, seventeen, eighteen, twenty-one, twenty-four toughness on that side, and twenty, thirty-two, forty power. So you could stay alive. <laughs> but it is essentially a full board wipe. And you're still going to get through for lethal, but this, <laughs> this whole sequence is just kind of crazy. I believe you stay alive at two or three here. Four. Okay. That was one off my mouth. That was like it was three, but... Yep, that's still going to be game to Necro, but I think the game should have been locked up last turn. Unless I'm, like, direly missing something, but I don't think I was. I think you just had a lethal attack there that we didn't choose to take. Because they can make their... They can either make their skin shifter a bird, or, I mean, they have a Yavimaya Dryad, so it just hacks through for two. And yeah, that should be game. But that was quite the reversal. Like, it's like, hey, when you got lethal, take lethal. Because, uh, you know, folks uh, will be playing some cards that can do some things and some stuff. And uh, Overrun's no joke. The Johnny the Greatheart into Overrun. <laughs> All right, and that appears to be game on that end. So I'm going to go to quick pause, guys. We'll be back momentarily for round number two. All right, guys, we're back. Um, so we're actually catching the uh, the um, the lower brackets here between Hemlecton and Bivy. So it'd be mono black versus black or green white tokens. Um, and then we'll jump over transition to the uh, well. You know what? I'll probably just cover both these at the same time. I don't I don't have hand cam information, so I think it's probably just fine to to watch both these simultaneously. I don't know how interesting a matchup this will be. This could be mono green versus mono red. Uh, I think mono green should generally be a bit favored in it. We'll be jumping a bit. So we have a turn one ritual again. Or is it like a fa current of phage? Oh, we have the ritual. Alright, so ritual is in effect. <laughs> Pretty sweet to see the ritual turns on, on one. Alright, just disruptive card. So, they're OP mulligan pretty heavily. I guess this makes uh, some decent sense. Hemlethan does run on quite a few lands, so they will generally have functional... They'll generally be able to cast spells. Um, Necropotence turn one. Mana Dork, not bad. Um, my guess is if Gosman has the opportunity to blow this thing up. They will try to do it. All right, they do not, but they have a Zergo. They have a one drop of their own, which is a Zergo. Sometimes you can actually play to your favor too, not blowing up the turn one dork, especially if they play something that like dies to Arc Trail on the following turn. But out of their deck, I generally tend to assume that they're going to play something big. If it's like a leatherback Bayloth, that kind of stinks. That's one downside to like Avicen's Pilgrim. It does not make the green mana, which is that definitely needs. It's very green pip intensive. Alright, jumping over. So we've got Ginger Brute and uh, Eternal uh, or yeah, Eternal Taskmaster, which is essentially a, a very slow recursion card, but it's a 2-3 two, for 2, which is not a bad one. Putting the beats on. Alright, the Zergo gets in. Possibly trying to bait any uh, counter uh, counter spell, but any pump spell. Any counter play. Um, Firebrand. I think I would probably just knock out this Avacyn's Pilgrim here. Um, they weren't able to do anything with it last turn, and they're probably going to be able to do something with it next turn at four. So I think I like killing it. And then if you have this, yeah, I really like killing it at this point in time. Even though they did nothing with it, like that doesn't mean they don't have a Garouk, uh, you know, um, or you know, some other four drop. Like you know, uh, oh, they do have something though. Oh, Boon Sader. Well, Boon Sader's not not the worst to see. I mean, like it's a lot of damage. But they are back a land drop, essentially. If they don't make their next land drop, I think that Gosmic can be in a pretty good position. Attacking here makes sense. The Frenzied Goblin, again, kind of just renders... Most threats that don't have Shroud or Hexproof moot. Ooh, we have Mogus's Favor on this card, making it a 4-2. 
that's a pretty cool, like, newish card um, with the the escape cost on it. it. Gets plus one, minus two. I think it was primarily used as a removal spell in limited formats, um, but, you know, you could definitely use it as a pump spell as well. Ooh, Chandra's Phoenix. That's actually a big one. Flyers are going to be tougher for the bottle green deck to deal with. I believe they are probably playing some spiders. We know for a fact they're playing the uh, skin shifter, which can turn into a bird and block it. But the biggest thing with Chandra's Phoenix is that it's a recursive source of card advantage. Uh, this thing does not die easily unless you exile it. All right, they put a blocker down. You know, an arc trail here would be pretty good. That'd be or uh, arc lightning or uh, flames of the fire brand could just board wipe their OP. Uh, Necro's uh, land kind of takes to show a little bit here. I think they're at 34 because uh, they're more mana dork based, uh, but there are some liabilities with that uh, as well. As you can kind of see here. All right, what do we got going over here? So the ginger brute uh, went away. It doesn't appear they're getting it back. Let's say they cycled a Foul Mire Knight, or it took a Foul Mire Knight on Adventure. I forget the, uh, the Adventure half of this card's name. Profane Insight. Um, and they're saying go. So, decent clock, but the Tokens deck is pretty good at making bodies. It looks like they're not really finding ways to do that, though, unfortunately. Alright, so down to eight, and they have a three card. Uh, I feel like this is like a a Leatherback Bayloth or something like that. Alright, so it's a triple green card. Because, like, I, I kind of felt like they were trying to cast this uh, with their Avacyn's Pilgrim on uh, turn two, I want to say. Alright, Lightning Strike. What does it knock out here? It's going to face. Okay. They're just going for lethal. They're saying, hey, you better stay back and block, buddy. They're Okay, they're not doing it, though. I feel like this is probably game over. If they're going to face there as opposed to, like, one of the threats or one of the blockers... It means they got it. I think Gosman plays a lot of these style of decks. It's like a Brimstone Volley. Slaying Fire. Okay, Slaying Fire is 4 damage with Adamant. Uh, cost paid, all red. Um, and they attack with the uh, Chandra's Phoenix and uh, take game number one versus Mono Green, which is, in general, not a matchup that I think you want to tend to see. Uh, Advent of the Worm was cast at instant speed, but Vendetta was cast. Still does 4. Um, I believe it does tough damage and toughness. Equal to toughness, yeah. You lose that much life. Um, Brindle Show is a good one, though. Brindle Show is just going to buy a lot of time. It's a pain in the butt to uh, attack into, to block, all that. Um, yeah, just give him some time. Throne of the uh, God Eternals is a card that's real, or God Pharaoh, I'm sorry, is, is really good against, like, um, control style decks. Against this style of deck, like, where you have to block, uh, more so, uh, not as much, obviously. All right, so let's check out what happens here. Necro is going to be on the, the uh, play this game. Um, which, I mean, in this matchup, should favor them, uh, obviously. But I think going into Game 3, the relevant part's going to be, like, what do you have in Game 3 if you're able to seal this one up? Gosman's going to look for hands that have lands, and then, in my opinion, like, you're going to want some good two-for-one burn-style spells to deal with the Mana Dorks early, um, ideally at, at card advantage. Necro, I think, just really wants cards that they can cast, because their cards are all pretty good against Red Deck wins. Like, they all trade generally at disadvantage, because they have more toughness and more power. Now, Jungle Lion is not the sort of one you want, though. They could have a pump spell to protect it. I'm pretty sure they drew that for the turn. There's a dart. Yeah, Lava Dart's pretty savage here. Um, that card, also a two-for-one. It may not seem like you're pitching a land, but lands and red deck wins are, are temporary means to playing the game of magic. <laughs> that is it. Once they've done their job, you can get rid of them pretty willy-nilly as Fire Blast is shown over history. All right, Troll Ascetic is going to be a tough one to deal with, so you gotta got to either go around it, go over it, go under it. You know, you're, you're not going to burn it out very easily unless you have Sweepers in your deck, which it's very possible Gosman's running... Um, uh, can't think of it right now. The one that does three to everything, or three to face. Well, they have Krinko. Krinko is one that you definitely want to block, and if you have an Infuriate or a Brute Strength, I want to say, or Brute Force... You can definitely pile it over the top of uh, Troll Ascetic for a turn or two and get it big enough to uh, not have to grow it. All right, jumping back over. Again, it still looks like this black deck's in a pretty good position right here. They also have a flyer. I would have been half tempted just to make the flyer here, and if they have Condemn, they have Condemn. Oh, Galta? Oh, that's what they stole. Oof. That's big. I can see why they made this play then. You definitely want to get Galta on the board. Yeah, I was going to say, I like the attack here. I like the attack here with both. With all of them, yeah. Just to pile the damage in. This one looks like it's probably over, but the tokens deck can have some pretty good comebacks. That's going to be a lot of dorks. 
they must have a pump spell for the uh, Land of War Visionary because they're they're evidently not looking to uh, block with their Troll Ascetic, which is a card that's a pretty effective blocker. There should be a lot of Gabos too. Woof. Alright. Did they manage to do something over here? Oh, they did. Was it Dusk Dawn? Yeah, Dusk Dawn. It's the card we were talking about the last game. Dusk Dawn came down and managed to basically give them their second life here, the second wind. Um, not in a bad spot anymore. I guess they still have the Tomb of Arami. So, yeah, Tomb of Arami is still going to be problematic. I mean, they could have Condemn as well. What does Dawn do here? Two or less? Does Dawn bring anything back? It brings back the uh, um, La Maz Secrets. Actually, it brings back a lot of this stuff. It brings back the Gonti, brings back the Eternal Taskmaster. It's not per se great for you. They're attacking the Ajani, though, as opposed to going direct. That is a lot of token generators. Hammer Garrison and uh, Krenko are really packing the heat here. Necropotence goes for another attack. It evidently was allowed through because six damage has been done total to Gosmet, which means that that's two, what, two, two troll aesthetic attacks. Um, this is a lot of power, though. So, what do, what do they have? Pump spells? Like, if they just have a Flames of the Fire brand, they can sweep the board and attack for just a metric crap ton. Or Arc Trail, even. Alright, the Dart. The Dart's gonna get the Yavamaya Dryad, which they don't opt to pump. I don't mind just sweeping the last one, either. Slaying fire to face. Yep, makes sense. An attack with all. This is uh this is a lot of pressure. I feel like Trollo said it could have probably done some really positive things staying back this game. It's just really hard. The power of Trollo said is that it just blocks so goddamn well, right? And right now, you got a blocking issue. I mean, now you really can't block it, I don't think. Alright, so they have a Flash creature. Could be, again, the Boon Seder. Alright, Boon Seder's not bad here, but, like, at this point, you're down to one card, and, like, what are you eating? You're trading with something. You're trading with either the Krenko or the Hanware Militia, Garrison Militia, and you're taking, what, eight? Eight to nine damage here. So you could just be dead to a burn spell if you don't block the biggest one, which is a Krenko in this case. All right, burst lightning on that. I don't. That that was a play error. I think you generally do that before blocks, because uh, mm, yeah, you get three in that way. But hey, mistakes happen. It's all right. Unless you were trying to see if they'd block the hammer militia and maybe the one extra. Actually, that's that's fair. Yeah, if they block the hammer militia, they do three. Put them at a three. Maybe they had a three damage burn spell in hand. They were trying to get a little greedy and see if they could just get them. All right, Gosmet takes down the match. And that was an O two. All right, Mogus's favor going on this other oh, seventeen. Oof, oofta. So evidently, something happened to this Arami. It got Field of Ruined. That's what happened. Yeah, I was kind of shocked there was no Arami getting made. Um, I, yeah, I guess it's just yeah they're getting getting a ton of life off this thing, so they got to knock it out. All right, a Johnny. It's a, not a bad card. It's more life gain. Yep. Tracking Gosmet. I caught your game. Yeah, this is a game that seemed almost hopeless, and now just through vast <laughs> amounts of life gain is kind of slowly shifting. Um, yeah, woof. Okay, get attack in here. 
and probably crank out yeah you know, one of the two Johnnies. Couldn't tell you which, but yep, makes sense. And what's their next best card? Alright, Distress, probably going to see a land. I don't know if it's going to reveal for me, though. Alright, it's Overwhelming Stampede. Yeah, not that that also makes a lot of sense for it to be in their hand. It's an unfortunate one to actually lose here, because, I mean, if you do top deck, like, you know, any sort of vast token generation, Overwhelming Stampede can account for a victory out of nowhere, essentially. Alright, we have Dawn, which is going to bring back some of, uh... Uh, what just happened? They have nothing in their bin. So it's already exiled? I guess they just dawned for fun. Okay, fair enough. Did it not work? From your graveyard to your hand. Okay, oh, okay, never, never mind. It did work. It just goes to hand. I thought they was, these went to battlefield for whatever reason. Which should make the card infinitely better. It's probably why it wasn't played as much in a standard rotation. It's probably also why it's a penny card. Because if it returned them to the battlefield, it'd be quite good. Um... All right, so Shote is back. In the minimum, the Shote trades really well with their board. It just docks out this uh, Carnophage. All right, yep. That's going to hit a creature, though, right? Because they got off of the Dawn. Yes, yeah, Champion. So, <clears throat> yeah, Brindle Shote, definitely a problematic card here. It will trade off favorably with the Carnophage. I guess, hmm. like, now you'd like to have this uh, Mogus' favor just to kill off this Shote. It essentially some semblance of, like, card parity, uh, because you're still going to get to 3-3, but at a minimum you're just spending, you know, expent cards in your bin. I think you just ship them all. I think you got to, I mean, if you're not paying the mana, if you're paying the life to, to um, not have it get tapped, you're probably attacking with it, or you're planning on blocking with it next turn. And my guess would be the Brindle Show won't attack, if only the 1-1 uh, one, one gets in there. Sorry for the background acoustics, folks. There's a significant uh, electrical storm here where I'm at. Oof. That's a lot of mana. So the Mono Black deck is, is definitely hit what appears to be a significant pocket of mana. The Champa Land Bolt will come down. This you can kill off with Mogus's Favor, which is actually one incentivization not to block, unless they draw a creature, which can now make it bigger than Mogus's Favor is able to deal with. But they're playing against Mono Black. Mono Black is pretty good at killing creatures, come to find out, and no shit. And I think at this point, you're, you're fine to just get in there for some damage. Actually, Vigilance is kind of awkward, right? Because uh, Vigilance means that uh, this thing doesn't work. Yeah, it's tapped creatures. Alrighty. Does this only work on non-token creatures? Okay. But yeah, Johnny's definitely a little awkward with the uh, the throne. But being frank, at 28 life, you're probably in a pretty damn near unassailable position based on the cards that uh, Vivusi's running. Right, they're hanging back. Uh, my guess would be another land. Or a kill spell, possibly. And now it's like one overrun effect can definitely just get there. This this tokens deck can definitely grind. If it gets the time to grind, it can grind a game on. I uh, I played against uh, Hemlectin the other night with blue, uh, blue black. And it was, I think, definitely a matchup that was favored towards blue black. Like blue black with like wraths and like, you know, mystical teaching style deck. Control deck. Um, it's definitely favored towards the blue black deck for sure, but um, the games could go exceedingly long, like you know, thirty plus turn games because of the amount of uh, tokens they can generate. All right, we're going on to game number three. I believe uh, Hemlecton lost the first one, but this is going to be a two one game one way or another. So we get round three here in this match. And yeah, while I'm doing this, I'll just take the time out to kind of, like, inform you guys, like, what we're actually doing here. This is an event that I'm tentatively tentatively calling the Copper Tablet. And, um, you know, it's a free-to-play event with uh, some prize support right now. We're giving five tickets out. It's so a 4-1 split to first and second place. And for three rounds of Magic, that ain't bad. Um, you know, and the decks are literally a dollar each. Um, so, 
you know, we're, we're trying to get it in every week. I, the scheduling may change on it, but right now we're playing on uh, on Fridays uh, at uh, 1700 UTC, or Universal Standard Time. Um, Serrated Scorpion, this card's really sick. It's actually kind of a cool, like, kratzy style card. Oh, Paralyzed, too, that's OG. So, Serrated Scorpion, um, card's a 1-2 for 1. When it dies, each opponent loses 2 life and you gain 2 life. Paralyzed, really old school. This card's uh, sick. It uh, taps the thing, and then your OP can pay 4 to untap it during their upkeep. They're not going to pay 4. That's actually an, an, an ABUR card. Original set. <clears throat> Very effective, though. It's much more effective than you'd think. I mean, in the late, as the game gets longer, it's obviously less effective. But in the early game, against a Mana Dork, it pretty much kills it for the rest of the game. All right, got a 2-1 evasive thing. Yeah, I think staying back makes some sense. The Flyer is going to be pretty good. Um, this What is this card called? Ephemia? Ephemia? Yeah. She's quite decent. Just an evasive body. My card gets big. I'm curious if they actually attack here and try to trade off with the uh, Amara on the Foulmire Knight. Because Foulmire Knight, I think, generally is going to eat something unless they have, like, um, Rootborn Defenses or something like that, where, like, their stuff can get indestructible. Should be pretty good. Sign and Blood. Looking for mana, my guess would be. They find it. Have a land. Let's make this a good one. All right, they did. It's a Rami. All right, they're going to ritual something out here. A morph. There are a couple morphs it could be. Um, there's a possibility. I don't know if the card's legal, but there's the 3-2 that whenever another creature dies, you draw a card. Um, like Skin Thinner, I don't know if that's legal or not. But Skin Thinner is a morph. Um, I'm almost positive uh, Bane of the Living is illegal, but that's another card it could possibly be. I'm trying to just think of random cards that would be legal. Those are all ones that could make sense, but I don't know if they're all legal, to be frank with you. Actually, it's kind of cute. They have Paralyze in their deck, and that actually works with the Ephemia, right? You may exile enchantment, and then, yeah, it's pretty sweet. sweet. So if the birds ever dies, they can get another 2-2. Two, two. Yeah, I'm really curious what that morph is now. Oh, it could also be the one that, like, when you flip it over, it kills something with power 2 or less. Yeah, that card would make sense. I think it's like Silumgar Assassin, maybe? That probably makes more sense than Skin Thinner or Bane of the Living. Bane of the Living doesn't seem good in this build. Yeah, I think it's a 3-2. Possibly with Menace that, that kills a 2 power or less thing. Maybe 2 mana or less thing. Alright, we're getting there with Ephemia. It's a lot of mana to leave up, so like... You know, I don't know if they're playing like a spidery grasp or something like that or any sort of effect like that, but it can be leery of getting had by something along those lines. Oh, Dreadshade's big. Just a big thing. Yeah, Mono Black's a deck that I have a ton of love for. It, it, so far, it hasn't been doing great, uh, but it's a really sick deck. Is Triplicate Spirit something? Scatter the Seeds. All right, create three Sapperling tokens. All right, well, that's going to make their thing huge. So they have a 7-7 seven, seven now, but that still gets pretty effectively blocked by the Foulmire Knight, right? Unless they want to oust the Foulmire Knight. And it makes sense they have that, because it just... It, okay, Glorious Anthem is going to make this stuff big. It's going to make trading a lot less favorable. Okay. So I get another 2-2 two -two essentially right now, a 2-2 two -two life linker. This thing should probably get blocked out by the Fallmire, be my guess, though. The thing with Wayfaring Temple is like, well, it is a pretty cool card. It's very big. Like, it's just very easy to block.
Well, I can honestly see the Dreadshade jumping out front too, but I mean, if you're going to do that, you probably trade off with like the Serrated Scorpion and the Morph. Alright, that jumps in front. Cool. So I do feel like Vivucci's drawing to a land here. I just think from looking at their build, they probably do want the fourth land. But I could be incorrect on that. I mean, they did have the ritual last turn, and I mean, they still made what a three mana play off of it. Honestly, Arami wouldn't be bad in this matchup either. Just having a five-five flyer is pretty useful. Again, Nighthawk, great, because it flies, right? And it also has Death Touch, so it can randomly trade off with the Wayfaring Temple. I do think the Ephemia still gets in. I think you just need to keep chipping away. Yep. Alright. Like a pump spell or something like that. Dictative Heliod. It's going to make some big, big boys. Woof. Big woof. Yeah, now I think Vivucci's just dead. <laughs> That's a ton of life to gain. And a ton of threats to lose off the board at the same time. Um, yeah, I think this one's probably... Uh, Probably come into a conclusion here. Ooh, Thornbore Archer. I love that card. Alright, a bunch of aggressive creatures what they had. And yeah, I, I just don't think there's a, a good way to get out of this at this point. That's a lot of additional power to add to the board. I mean, it's exactly what? 12 extra power to add to the board. Not to mention 12 extra toughness, which is uh, pretty good. Makes it very hard to swing through with creatures, for sure. Alright. I mean, you probably... Tr oh, woof. I don't know. I'll be honest, I don't know what you do here. <laughs> You had a minimum. If you're going to block, you eat what you're going to block here, but I guess you don't. Yeah, the thing is, too, like, I think this black deck tends to need to be more mid rangey or more mid range control y um, in general, and I really love Suey Black. I've definitely tried building it in the format. Unfortunate. Uh, that was a cool set of games, though. Like, that was a really cool... Uh, uh, definitely a much more, like, back-and-forth uh, style of games uh, than we kind of saw in some of the other ones. I'm going to go to quick pause, guys, to set up round three, and we'll be back momentarily. All right, guys, we're back for round number three here. So we're going to have one uh, pair up, one pair down, because we're a four-player event right now. It's going to be Necroperton's first BFC. BFC currently um, is uh, 2 and then Necro is 1-1 uh, at the moment um, with Mono Green. That said, like, I do think that Mono Black has some distinct advantages versus the green deck, and that it can remove green creatures pretty easily. That said, like, the card quality of Necro's deck is, is gonna... From what I've seen, I've seen a lot of, like, one mana, two ones, essentially, out of the black deck. Which I think can get outscaled pretty fast, so you need a pretty decent basis of removal to deal with them. 
All right, ritual, ritual. They've been really good at getting the ritual. That's 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 a good one to have. That is the sort of thing that the black deck wants to do early and often, just to like put this deck under pressure. But the side to it is the green deck can sack creatures. Mana dorks can become vestigial in the mid game. You're probably gonna take at least two hits off this thing, get down to eight, and then have to start sacking stuff or putting down blockers that are capable of blocking it. There are some big, you know, vigilance style creatures. Garrick is probably not long for this world, would be my guess. They're gonna make a best. Possibly sack a best, but it's going to increase their mana pool next turn. Alrighty. I'm going to jump out real quick, guys, and see if uh, our other players have gotten started. It appears they have, so we'll get that game up as well. Alright, Gosmet wins the die roll. Not a bad place to be on red, and has a one drop. That's, that's a good start for Gosmet. Uh, seven card keep. Looks good. Seven card keep. Going to be a game, it appears. All right, yeah, the hippie. Again, these flyers are going to be great. Like just having flyers to get around the green blockers, because like we do know for a fact, we saw it in Necro's deck. They're playing cards like Phantom Centaur. Um, I know for a fact they're playing a couple other protection from black creatures in their deck, which can make it pretty difficult for the removal suite to actually deal with them. So you have to fly around them, essentially. That's a Wolfier Silverheart. That is uh, mono huge, I believe is the technical term. Um, that's a pounding, for sure. Question is, they have a kill spell. If they have a kill spell for Wolf here, I think they're in just a fine spot. If they do not have a direct kill spell for Wolf here, I think they can be in a challenging spot. Alright, yeah, that's a lot of damage to take. But if they have multiple kill spells, they can also just knock out this beast, kill the Garrick. And I kind of do like just getting rid of the Garrick. There was an option to see if they sacked off the beast as well. I mean, there's a possibility they would have to save their Garrick. They sack it off. They want the mana. I kind of like actually cracking their hand here. Yeah, because, I mean, the Garrick's not going to die from this and they can knock out a card. That said, Deathbridge Goliath is not really one you want to discard. I mean, it's better off being in the bin than it is in hand, but... It's uh, it's pretty good value. That's if next turn they'll be able to scavenge it on something they can play if it doesn't die. There's a thrashing Brontodon. Pretty large lad. Luxodon Warhammer, eh? That's a big hammer. Trample's pretty good, too. Um... <laughs> So the Garrick now does represent enough damage that they do have to deal with it in some way, shape, or form. The Hammer is also quite problematic, especially if they have, like, a Pump Spell. The ideal play for uh, Bivucci here would be just to kill this Thrashing Brontodon, knock the last card out of their hand. Alright. You should knock out Garrick and then knock out their, their last card here. They'll get some damage through, but I mean, you have pretty decent blocks in this thing. This gives plus three, six. Yeah, and lifelink. Nope. Yeah, I like knocking out the Garrick here. Getting the Crawl Harpooner out. And now, like, their obligation to, like, lock up this Warhammer and just swing is pretty high, I think. So they're not likely to play another creature out here. And again, they don't have a spectacular attack. I mean, they can, get, they can push through three points of damage at this point in time. Let's check out this other match here. All right, that's a lot of tokens. Oh, they can't gain life, though. So they took damage off Stigma Lasher. So basically, if enough of these creatures die, which is likely they will, then they're going to get to... Um, all right, Frontline Medic seems kind of irrelevant. Uh, maybe it's good for attacking, but uh, and it can block decently well. But trading creatures here is not great because there's a Barb Ring in play, and there's three, th four cards in bin. When they get to seven, they can just do the last two with the Barbie Ring. <laughs> this card is actually slightly relevant with the uh, Zergo. I like just slamming here. It's 
basically force blocks on everything. Um, some of it will trade favorably. Uh, some of it will just die, and if it dies, it's still kind of favorable. There's even a possibility they have a shock-like effect that they can get first strike to their Zergo. I mean, if they have a shock, they just kill him. I guess that's a stupid thing to say. They don't have shock, but I don't think Gosmit would slow roll it. But this is going to give them enough cards to just activate the Barbarian Ring. So they knock all that down and shoot the Barbie Ring at face and go into game number two, or round two of this match. Over here, yeah, they're looking pretty good. I mean, the hammer's annoying. They're at a lot of life. But the problem is going to be cards at this point. They don't have enough cards. They're not coming back on cards, right? They can't keep any cards in hand. And they are taking massive amounts of damage every turn. Master Myers is a cool one. I mean, maybe they're running Hurricane and they can just burn them out. <laughs> That'd be a pretty amazing win. No, doke. There's a Witch Stalker. But uh, they're still, yeah, they're still just dead. So that's on to round number two there. I do think this can be a tougher matchup for the white-green deck, for sure. But red deck is uh, pretty good in most every format it can be, and it's certainly good in this format as well. And, you know, as we saw in the first game, it could definitely pull off a win. I do think that, in general, the 2-2 uh, the Wither, I always forget that card's name, although I do run it in my builds, too, so I think it's quite good, uh, that stops life gain from the, for the rest of the game. Probably did a decent bit of work there. Alright, turn one Carnophage. That's a clock. Not the kind of clock you want to have because they're just going to play out. Yeah, stuff like Saddled Rimstag, which is just, you know, it just races real hard. And, like, here, like, you're going to take the two, you're going to attack, but, like, you're, you know, you're not exceedingly happy about it because they're probably not going to block and they're going to swing back for four unless you have a kill spell. Okay, what happened here? There's a token in play. Oh, Keljoran Outpost. Okay, so they're using Keljoran Outpost to make tokens. Seems sensible. I mean, it's a little early in the game for it, but... You know, you gotta do what you gotta do. Alright, we had a drill bit hitting a Sir Farron. And there's a hammer and some forest. And if they draw a creature, they're in a pretty good spot. If they don't, they can at a minimum get this hammer down. The thing that's kind of an issue with a hammer, especially this early against that many cards in hand, is that... It's very expensive to equip, and if you go to equip it next turn, for instance, and your opponent just removes the creature you equip it to, it's it's time walk, essentially, um, which can be rough with it being more expensive. All right, so we have Annex in, knocking out a token, and just saying go. So they're going to make more 1-1s, one I would assume. Yep. Seems reasonable. Swing for four here, down to, what, 14? <clears throat> My guess is going to see, yeah, we're going to see a pass here, and then we're going to see, like, if this thing gets equipped up, they're just going to kill it. I mean, if if they don't have a kill spell and they don't have a, a relevant play to make, all right, well, you have to probably kill it now. I guess you could wait. This thing is going to be a 4-4. Four, four. I guess you could just take the four here and then kill the runic Armasar. Because you'd rather attack. Which seems sensible as well. I did nothing. That seems like an unfortunate series of events then if you couldn't do anything. But Okay, they paralyzed that one. Alright, what's going on over here? A lot of burn spells have been spent. That is an Arc Slogger. That's a game ender right there. Uh, very rapidly. You definitely make your attack here. 
Yeah, Arc Slogger is just a beating of a card. If you're not familiar with Arc Slogger, I'll pull up the preview window for it. It's an old card, doesn't see a lot of play in any formats with the exception of this one. And like sometimes people play it in Canlander for lulls. It's a 5 mana, 4, 5, uh, 2 red and 3, and you can pay a red and exile the top 10 cards of your deck and do, uh, oh, that was announced, and do 2 damage to any target. Um, in a 100 card format, that's obviously a lot of damage. It's, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> It'd be a 20 if you have a full deck. But generally speaking, it's going to represent 14 to 16 damage in most standard games. All right. Well, you know, beside Bivucci kind of like being at a much lower life total, like they're doing a pretty admirable job of racing Necro here. They got a Vendetta off. Sarcomancy is just a blocker. They really do need to have a kill spell for this Garish Companion when it gets equipped up. There's a probability that Nec or that yeah that Necro does just go for um, an untap on the Runic Armasaur because the two five is just really hard to get through for the black deck. It has to pretty much hard kill it. Um, my guess would be though they'll go for the slightly more greedy line, which is just slam slam the. Uh, all right, we got this. Does it have Life Link, Death Touch? I assume Menace Life Link. Okay, so they're looking to trade on board then with the Garrick's Companion. Would be my guess. Yeah, black cards in general tend to be pretty good against green ones. It's traditionally been. Alright, this guy again. This guy is just a big, beefy dude, right? Yeah, he makes things, and it's equal to the number of creatures you have. Cool. Or his power is equal to the number of creatures you have. I believe their next draw should be the Arc Slogger again. Don't know their last card. If it's Burn, there's a possibility to look straight on board with the, uh, the uh, Warlord. The Iron Root Warlord. Nope, they're just going for this, which is actually fine too. I mean, if they block with the Iron Root uh, Warlord, they can just zap it with the Arc Slogger, which seems just as well to me. Actually, they trade favorably on board because of the increase in devotion. That's how devotion works. Oh, we have a Condemn as well. Evidently not. I think this is a, yeah, this is a trade you want to make. Oops. Alright, so that's Wolf here. Versus Ammon Eternal. Well, if they can uh, kill... Uh-oh, that's just a big boy. I suppose it does trade. Pump spell? No. They can just start trading with the Runic Armasaur, or using their mana to untap the Runic Armasaur, I suppose. Looks like they're probably going to a Game 3, though. I feel like the green deck's definitely in a favorable spot at this point. That's a lot of birds. I assume that means a Battle Screech was cast, and then flashback, yep. Okay. They knock out the birds, and go in for a... Well, it appears to be a very lethal attack. What saves them here? Nothing, really. Because if they have Condemn, Gosmic can just exile 60 cards and do a boat of damage. Yeah, they're going to do it now. Yeah, Arc Slogger, definitely very cool. Cool card in this format. And the format's generally slow enough and grindy enough that, like, you can get away with running it. Even on a red deck, wins deck. It's just very, uh... It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very powerful when you have 100 cards to work with. And there you go. There is uh, Arc Slogger doing its thing, doing its deck munching thing. Down to 17 cards in deck, but doesn't matter if they're dead, right? And congrats to Gosmit. Looks like they're going to be the event winner. Ooh, there's a Grasp of Darkness. All right. So, I mean, like, we could see a comeback here. This is an Arami. Arami does race pretty well. I can see taking a damage here. And then just firing off this Arami. Get him for two. Then hope your opponent mises a pump spell or a land. And then, you know... You get uh, basically a lethal attack, and not a lethal attack, but like you set them into a position where. All right, that's a Barontodon. Yep, Gosmet 2 0. I'm 
already. So did they hit the kill spell? That's a Keenra. Which is actually a pretty good one to hit here because it comes back from the bin. Okay, so they're going on to game number three. Cool. Yep, no, if Necro ends up hitting, like, a land there or something like that, although they're on a land light deck, they're on 34 lands, so, I mean, their chances of hitting, like, a relevant card are pretty high in mono green. I think they're, like, on 56 critters or something like that. It's a very high number of creatures. Um, then, yeah, I mean, if they if they had flooded a little more, I think the Rami could have gotten there, but it needed about one more turn of just missing. Alrighty, and on to game number three here. Alright, Swamp. Turn one, and a Scorpion. Serried Scorpion, eh. I, the card is really cool for like the Kratz style decks. I don't think it's going to trade very favorably in this matchup, although it's going to get to attack here, which is kind of nice. And eventually it is going to represent the loss and the gain of two life. As long as you can fade that Warhammer. Ooh, did they mulligan? They mulligan heavily, I think. Hopefully they have another land. Alright, good. Definitely like to see games. That's a good one to have. As long as it doesn't get, like, Brontodon onto this turn, or next turn, rather, it could possibly take over the game. It can make some pretty large threats pretty quickly. That's an unfortunate one to see again. That's one that you don't, yeah. You don't really want to see it. But yeah, if this uh, Dreadhorde Invasion can go on long enough to become a 6-6 six, six and gain lifelink, that's pretty good. Sign and Blood, probably looking for land, kill spell. That's a cool swamp. That's definitely a good choice in swamp. I think it's Stronghold Swamp. Alright. Basically a 2-1 attacker. <laughs> what I'm curious about on the Necro side is what do they opt to do this turn? Are they uh, attacking or blocking? I think their attacks with the Troll Ascetic and the Red Deck Winds matchup were really aggressive, probably too aggressive. Um, be curious to see how they do it in this matchup. I, I think there's definitely credibility either way to it. You know, untap. And equip. Well, they still have regen mana. I honestly don't mind just throwing the scorpion in front of it, but... I guess you can wait on that. So you're taking a lot of damage off the Dread Horde invasion, so... Throwing the, the scorpion in front of it, and just kind of, you know... Eating their mana up seems fine. But it also depends on what you have access to in hand as well. Alright, Fallmire. Or, yeah, Fallmire Knight, or the, uh, what is it? Profane Insight. Half of it being cast here, possibly looking for other land drops. So they can replay it and have a detoucher. I think you just smack him for four here. I don't think you send the Scorpion in. I think losing that additional five life um, is, is too much here. They want to block with the 2-2. Two -two. Hmm. Can't say I understand that line of play. I like just trading off, not trading off the scorpion, but chumping with the scorpion. Uh, doming them for two, gaining the two, and then, you know, keeping the zombo around so it can get bigger and eventually get lifelink, ideally. Alright, gets in there. All right, they want to force regeneration here. I mean, there is the possibility that they just don't regenerate it if they really want to cast a 5-drop. <clears throat> Leatherback Bayloth, just massive creature. 4-5 for 3. Not a bad one. That's a good one to have there. Get them, them get rid of the uh, get rid of the most problematic threat. Get this thing down. It at least jumps.
I actually don't mind this block. Um, you can basically force a trade with the uh, Foul Meyer Knight on something better, ideally. Essentially, the Dreadhorde invasions become a uh, black force field at this point. Which is the old term that some folks would call Bitter Blossom in certain matchups. You just use it as a force field. Essentially take one every turn from one of their threats. Um... Okay, this allows them to return the uh, the Shriek Maw. If they have a land, they can do that all this turn. Alright, we're hanging back here. <clears throat> well, that's a lot of mana on Necro side. Yeah, you can if you'd like. Um, I'm actually in the middle of recording. All right, Dreadhawk ticks again. Um, hmm. And what we got going on? So we got the untap with nothing. So I do think Necro is on, like, BS. Like, pump spells, probably. Probably pump spells. I assume they knock out the Druid of the Cowl here. And then continue to aggress their opponent. Vendetta? Okay. Like, actually, a pump spell there could be used to get lethal, right? Chip in for four. Uh-oh. I'm going to say, if it's like uh, the 4-2... Yeah, it appears it is going to be the 4-2. Alright, ram through. Okay, ram through, and then it's going to be lethal. Yep, that's game. Well, it's not lethal, but they're going to die to the Dreadhorde Invasion tick. Unless they have instant speed life gain, like moments craving could yeah, okay. Alrighty. And that is gonna conclude the series, guys. So Gosman's gonna take it down for four tickets. Necropotence come in second on their mono green shell. Um, and then uh Hemlectin uh and uh Bivucci. So very cool. Glad everyone could make it out. I'm gonna go ahead and cut it there again. This is Penny Dreadful Lander or Penny Dreadful Highlander uh event call the Copper Tablet, Penny Lander. Uh, very fun format. You get to actually brew some pretty interesting decks and try to assemble some different ways of winning the, uh, in, in, in the format and other constraints that you have. So I'm going to go ahead and cut it there, guys. I hope you enjoy getting to watch some of the gameplay and then watch this event uh, unfold. Um, all right, I'll catch you all later.